Hey folks, welcome back to another uh, review with yours truly, Sam Healy. Today I'm going to uh, talk about uh, Hoplomachus Origins, a uh, game from Chip Theory Games. And it is basically a gladiator uh, arena battling uh, chip movement, uh, hand management a little bit because you got to decide what gladiators you're going to use and that type of thing and what tactics are going to be employed during the battle. Um, let's take a look. Okay, in Hoplomachus Origins, uh, you're basically going to be getting these things in the box. Uh, they're going to come with uh, three mats, one from Xanadu, one from Atlantis, and one from El Dorado. Uh, and those are the arenas that each battle is fought in. Uh, you get your health chips in two different colors. You get uh, 20 gladiators and uh, eight tactics to deal with. And then you also have a bunch of special gladiators and champions um, and some other markers that are used during the game. Then you also get uh, your your dice that you fight with over here. And then you also get a couple of dice. Uh, so let's take a look at gameplay. Now, one game of Hapamagus Origins uh, takes place in three different battles. And how you win each battle differs by uh, the arena that you're playing in. For example, in Atlantis, it's basically just a brawl. You are trying to eliminate your other players' uh, gladiators. In Xanadu, you are, it's kind of like a king of the hill mechanic. The main way is, is to um, have your gladiators on these arena hexes, and if they are on the arena hex, uh, at the beginning of their turn, then they score you one point, and that's what these guys are used to, te to keep track of. So the first person to get six points in Xanadu wins. Now, if you eliminate your opponents before you get to six points, you still win. And then in El Dorado, you are, uh, it's kind of like a capture the flag type thing. You have these tribute tokens that are placed one here and one over there. This side is trying to get their tribute over to this side while this team is trying to get their tribute over to this side. Um, and, and the first person to do that wins. Again, if you eliminate your opponent's uh, forces before you achieve that, you still win. But uh, that is the uh, way that that is accomplished in El Dorado. Um, you are going to, first of all, draft your teams. And uh, the way that happens is all 20 gladiators and all eight of the tactics are laid uh, face up so that everybody can see it and you basically take turns drafting your team um, Each team has two specials four regular gladiators and then two tactics and uh, it's it's uh, there's a lot of replayability there because as you can see um, I did not use all of the uh, Tokens or anything like that. So there are plenty left over uh, to do a number of different things with so um, <clears throat> there is some play replayability there that uh, I think is worthy of note uh, now in Xanadu as as uh, if you can recall this is the main objective kind of like a king of the hill um, type uh, scenario uh, now this team will be able to deploy in the four deployment zones that are nearest it. The deployment zones are marked by the red, the bright red blotchy blood stains or whatever you might want to call them. And so these are red teams, uh, deployment zones, and then the four over here would be blue teams, the deployment zones. Now there are a number of different things that go into choosing your team. First of all, uh, you'll want to take a look at each token. For example, the spearman here, uh, he has three life. He is able to battle at a range of one. He can move two, that's the green circle. Then he has a tactics range of one. So uh, he can uh, deploy tactics uh, tiles or tokens to hexes that are uh, himself or one adjacent. And then here are the dice that he, are able to, he, he is able to roll. He can roll one blue and one yellow. That's one of the nitpicks I have about the game is that uh, this is purple. That's not blue, but it actually means blue. So it's just a printing error, but uh, again, just nitpicky. So he will, for his basic attack, he will roll a blue and a yellow die. Uh, he has an inherent ability and an innate ability, lunge and true strike. And to find out what those mean, you simply have to turn over to the back of the instruction manual 
and it tells you pretty clearly, first of all, true strike basic attacks by this unit can be used as alternate attacks. Uh, there are some people in the game that have a special defense against basic attacks. So you can uh, say that you're making an alternate attack with your base attack. And then lunge, right there in the center of the page, it says, if this unit does not use its own move, increase its attack range by one for this turn and change the attack to two green dice. All right, so uh, those are just a couple of special abilities that, that uh, the spearmen can do, but that just gives you an idea of what you're kind of looking at here with the different uh, abilities and, and such forth. Whoever did not go first in drafting the tokens uh, goes first in the actual beginning of the battle. So we'll say that uh, red team was able to start drafting first, so blue team will actually go first. So basically on the first turn, you are able to deploy one of your units and one of your tactics, or one of both. So on the first round, I'm going to uh, deploy uh, one of my troops. I'm gonna go ahead and take my defender. Uh, the defender has five health, so I'm going to take five of my blue health chips and then put him on top of it. And then he's going to go in one of the deployment zones. I'll just go ahead and put him here. All right, so the defender, the cool thing about the defender is that he can actually intercept attacks uh, from uh, that are being levied against friendly adjacent units. So he's a pretty cool uh, thing. That's the, that's the first turn, I'm done with that one. Now it goes to the red team. Uh, we're going to go ahead and take the attacker here. Now the attacker has uh, three health, so we take three of those, and we'll place the attacker right here. Okay, now the attacker has a, ha, rolls three dice for attack, one black, one blue, and one yellow. And then they also have this whirlwind ability, which is really nasty. Basically, it can uh, roll a, bla uh, a yellow die for every adjacent enemy unit. The hits that are generated from that roll apply to all the enemy units that are adjacent. So nasty little fellow there. So he can uh, deploy there and it's done. We move on to the second turn for blue team. Second turn for blue team, we're going to uh, deploy one of our champions here. Uh, her name is Korikos and uh, she has a special ability that allows her to um, she is ready. That is her latent ability. So what ready means is that she can, when she's deployed, she can move and attack as if she were an eligible uh, gladiator. So uh, she has a movement of three. Um, we're going to go ahead and go one, two, and just move it two here. Remember, the uh, King of the Hill mechanic I need to score points at the beginning of my turn, so I'm going to put her there. Um, and then all other uh, eligible gladiators can move and attack. So uh, we're going to go ahead and move the defender. He has a movement of one so that he can kind of protect uh, Korikos as well. And that's the end of my turn. We don't have range on anybody. Uh, they both have a range of one for attack, so that's all I can do. Go ahead and bring out uh, our Centurion. He is a he is a four healther and we'll place him right there. He only has a movement of one, he has a movement of two. Uh, so what we're going to do here, he cannot move yet because he was just deployed. He's, no long, he's not eligible for moving or attacking. But our attacker is definitely eligible, so we're gonna go one, two, and we're going to attack uh, Korikos. All right, so we look at the attacker. He rolls a black, a blue, and a yellow. So we take those three dice, and we're just going to do a basic attack. All right, so we have, a, we have two hits on Korikos. Now, remember the special ability of the defender. He's going to absorb that attack. So instead of Korikos taking the hits, I'm go the blue team is going to elect to allow the uh, defender to take those attacks for her so that she is not killed. She only has two hit points. Okay, so that's how that worked out. And that turn is over. Go back to the blue team. Blue team scores one point for having one person on one of the arena hexes. Okay, so we now have one point. Javeliner, he has two health, but he also has range attack. So he can attack three away. Um, 
We're going to put him, we're going to deploy him right there. Okay. Now, he has first strike, which allows him to attack uh, the first time that he is deployed. So, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to try to take out this attacker here. Uh, this guy is going to go ahead and move during the move phase. Uh, she's just going to stay there because um, she doesn't need to move. She's already in adjacency with him. Uh, so, she scores one hit with no roll. That's an automatic thing. So, automatically, one comes off. And then the defender here is going to also attack. Rolling one black die. That's a hit. And then the javeliner is also going to toss um, a javelin at the attacker. And that's a miss. All right. So that's the end of my turn. And now it goes back to... Um, red team. So we're going to uh, get our defender out there and he gets he has five health so we'll go put him out there. The uh, Saturian is now able to move uh, because he is he was not deployed this turn. Okay so we're just going to move the Centurion one and he'll be able to attack this turn. He does have the ability shove. Now the only problem is that we've already moved our one but during the next movement phase if the defender is still there he's going to be able to move where the defender is and push the defender back one uh, space with that special ability of shove. So uh, we'll see how it goes. Um, first of all, the attacker is uh, going to do his whirlwind attack, and that means he's going to roll two uh, yellow dice because he has two uh, opponents adjacent to him. And then these hits will be scored on both of those people. All right, so that's two hits. Uh, it is an alternate attack, so the defender can't soak up her uh, her uh, damage, so she is eliminated. Okay, so that's turned over. And then he also takes two hits of damage, but has one left, so he's still good to go. But now the Centurion gets to attack, and he rolls a green. And that was also a hit, so the defender is toast as well. Now, the, the, there, there's nobody else that left to attack except for the Javeliner. He's out of range. So uh, it goes over to the blue team. Play continues in that fashion until one person or the other has reached six points or eliminates the other side's uh, characters. Uh, either way scores them a win for this battle. And then it would be randomly chosen what the second battle will be. And then, of course, randomly chosen once again what the third battle would be. And the person who has won uh, the most house reputation points at the end of all three battles actually wins the game. And that is basically how you play Hapamaka's Origins. Now, there are a few things that I want to go over with you right now. Uh, first of all, there are solo rules, solo variants. So uh, basically what you can do is uh, take this little list of... Uh, trials. There's 20 trials on this card for you to go through. Uh, they even have a nice little chart that tells you um, uh, how the uh, challengers are going to be acting and that type of thing, what to do on their turns and that type of stuff. Um, I thought that was a pretty cool thing that uh, you can play this solo and they have pretty solid rules to do that. I'm not really a solo variant kind of person but uh, I know a lot of people are, so I did want to mention that uh, this is a, a, a viability with Hapamakas Origins. Uh, another thing that I wanted to talk about with this idea of house reputation. Now, I did mention it during the gameplay segment of the review where uh, there is house reputation. Basically, for every battle that you win, you, if you win the battle, you get 10 points. If you lose the battle, um, you get minus five points. So, um, at the end of the three battles, whoever has the most house reputation is considered the winner. It can actually have a storyline to it because it also provides uh, effects to your house reputation. So if your house reputation is uh, only 10, you cannot draft the defenders. 
um, which are which is a type of gladiator from uh, that you can that you can draft. They're really useful. You actually saw it in action uh, during the gameplay section. And so these are just rules that you can follow to kind of restrict yourself, or it can be actually a really cool bonus uh, if you're if you're higher up on the house reputations thing. The rule book says, you know, later on after you've you've become very familiar with playing and that type of thing, that maybe this is something you can add into it to kind of spice it up. This is just a one or two player game. It does not go above that, and I think that's a benefit because it doesn't try to overthink itself. Um, it is a very simple game. It's a very light game. Although I will say this, I think it, it, it tries to be or it wants to be more strategic or more tactical than it actually is. Um, I found the dice to be very heavy handed in this game. Basically, if you don't pick the right troops that are rolling the higher percentage dice uh, for hitting, uh, the likelihood of you winning is pretty low, doesn't matter how tactical you can be. I like rolling dice, don't get me wrong, and I like the randomness factor that they can add to a game. I just thought that it was pretty heavy and it was almost like it was written in stone um, unless you just got lucky. And again, for a game that's trying to be tactical, that's trying to be strategic, I think that might be a little bit of a detriment to it. The gameplay is very simple. The gameplay is very fun. Uh, I did find it kind of cumbersome to have to move those health stacks of, of discs around. I'd, I'd really much rather have a, a, a miniature or something to that effect to manipulate rather than this, this possibly teetering uh, stack of tokens around the arena. I, I think it's a solid game. It's, it's not bad, but it's definitely not great. All right, um, but it, it is decent, and I think there is a lot of enjoyment that can be had here. Um, for myself, I'm going to give this one thumb up, not two, um, and not one and a half, because I, for what it is, the dice are very heavy-handed, um, but it is a, a neat, interesting little game. See you on the flip side, folks. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool stuff in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com.